Welcome to the Startup Grind. This is our seventh. Um, before we've hosted um, Ben Leon of Coco Coco, Oreo Colo, uh, formerly at Ushahidi, uh, Kanini Mutoni, who runs Mayazimia, Eric Hassman, Mutoni Ndonga. And it's been amazing. The point is to uh, bring into the tech space other industries as well. Uh, open up the world to tech is beyond building apps. Help them understand the problems that exist in industry. Like, what is the gap there? Me and my amazing skill, how can I build a business model around a problem that actually exists in an industry I don't know about, but where there's huge potential? And that's why we're doing this. So today, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker, Minutu. Uh, if you asked him to, to introduce himself, he'd say, some guy. Yeah. <laughs> But he's not just some guy. Uh, we met him, uh, we spent two hours with him. He's one of the few people who, before we met him, we didn't know much about because like, despite our good um, research skills, there's not much you can find about him online. Yeah. But he, his, his is an amazing story of uh, a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes, but equally a lot of lessons learned uh, along the way. Um, okay, I won't give too much history. Uh, I'd like to welcome Munyutu and Odanga, who's going to introduce himself as he kicks us off. Hello. Hello again and welcome to Startup Grind. Another round of applause for Buana Munyutu, please. Now, me, Pia, Simunipe, Makofi, Buana. <laughs> so today's, uh, you may have a seat. So today's topic is about mistakes. Um, how many of you here have at one time started a business or are currently running their own businesses? Okay, how many have never had the chance to start their own business or run, are, are currently running their own business. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, one person. <laughs> Two, three. Okay, so definitely we have a lot of people here who are involved in entrepreneurship. I'd like to introduce my, our guest today, uh, Mr. Munyutu Waigi. Thank you. Uh, Munyutu, help me here. What are your mistakes? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying a, a very popular uh, presenter's coming. I should come and like... <laughs> and probably do the signature. Yes. But anyway, uh, before I start, I'd like to let the audience know that you feel free to ask questions uh, during the dialogue. Uh, we would prefer to have this as an engaging conversation about the mistakes that we all make in entrepreneurship. So Munyutu, take it away. Tell us sure, about thanks. yourself. Yes. Um, firstly, caveat before we start. I'm not here to say I know it all. All I can do is tell you what I've learned and my experiences and how it worked for me. So as Odanga mentioned, please, throughout the entire um, Engagement, please ask me questions. This is supposed to be a dialogue. I don't like talking about myself. Um, I would like to have a conversation with the whole crowd. Um, questions about anything that's relevant to you, I'm more than happy to respond. Um, but to answer your question a bit about myself, wow, wow where do I start? Background. background, okay. So, background. I grew up outside Kenya. You can tell from my funny accent. Um, I spent 15 years outside the country. And one morning I woke up and I said I need to come back home. My mom thought I was nuts. I was working for um, a consulting, management consulting firm called Accenture. And I just had enough. And I just knew I needed to come home and build something that's, um, that will outlive me. You know? um, and that was five years ago. So I came home, and I want to thank one person in this room immensely. is a man called Eric Hersman. When I first came, I started a company called Mokum Wireless, and what we're doing is Wi-Fi. 
So I traveled to Nairobi. I was based in Mombasa because that's where I'm at. Um, that's where I'm from. I came to Nairobi and I told um, Eric, I was like, hey, I know you don't know me. Uh, I don't know you. But I'd like to give you free devices for your connection because they were just launching iHub, I believe. And he had about 200 odd people. And I said to him, hey, I'll give you two devices for free. Let me know how it goes. And that was it. And that was the start of a relationship that has lasted five years and counting. And again, thanking the iHub community. I launched Rupal here in 2010 on 6th of December on that wall. And thank you again to the tech community here for making it happen for us and all the support. A bit about myself beyond that, um, I study information systems. It's not programming because that makes me fall asleep. Um, it's literally project management. And I did that for about four years. Um, but most of my background is around understanding how business and technology come together. Okay. So tell me about how you transitioned from Mocom to Rupu and now to Umati. All right. Mistake number one, do not go into business with friends. You'd rather make friends with the people you started business with. Um, I started my first company with a friend, and that meant I was constantly making excuses to myself as to why the business is not moving forward, because he's a friend. Um, there's always the uh, diplomatic approach you have to have with friends when, you're, when things are not going right. To be really honest with you in business, you just have to bite the bullet sometimes and just call, pardon me, call the bullshit to say, stop, it's not working. But because you're working with a friend, you can't, you can't have that approach and you end up wasting so much time um, finding ways to go around how to explain yourself. And it's not that you're trying to be uh, a douchebag, you're just being straightforward. This is not working, we need to stop and take a different route. So my first instance in my first company was my first mistake, starting a company with friends. Uh, but with that said, uh, we got really, 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 really good traction in Mombasa. But I quickly learned Mombasa is not the city for tech per se or at the time. Um, and that's when I shifted my focus to Nairobi. But let me ask, um, your friend Eric Hasman also mentioned that starting, friend, starting, starting friends with a business, <laughs> starting a business with friends is, seems to be a bad idea. Very bad. We had a chat earlier and you mentioned that you've done this countless times. Okay, not countless times, but a few you, times. You, didn't, you didn't learn your lesson and you did it again. Yeah, I mean, that's part of entrepreneurship. You try and do the same thing, expect different results until something breaks. Um, yes, I'm, I made concessions and I said, hey, let's try again with a different friend. Um, because frankly, it's your lowest hanging fruit for good resources. Um, if you're looking for an accountant, you always know somebody who knows somebody who it's like a family friend or a friend of yours who's been doing accounts. If that's your first point of contact, great. Let it be just a point of contact. Don't work with them. Because the, you have to establish hierarchy very quickly as to how you will interact with that person. Yes, it's very flat uh, as an organization, but then someone needs to know where the box stops. End of story. Yeah. But let me ask. Uh, this is the point. Okay, I've been... I read a lot. And I've come across... One of the functions, of course, a lot of people are skeptical about education today, but one of the functions that even places like the iHub serve are as marketplaces. They allow people from different backgrounds in different places to become friends, yeah. and of course, hopefully end up starting businesses as well. Um, if you were to look at even the top partnerships that have come to define the tech era of today, you've got Brin, and Page, you've got Balma and Gates, you know, you've got Sandberg and Zucker, but most of these Fair people enough. were classmates. So I'm going to ask you this question. Um, do you think that because of incompetency in hiring, yeah, uh, you 
looked at a friend and said, okay, fine, let me just take him in because he's a friend. Yeah, but you may have other friends who are competent enough to do the job. Does it mean that you're giving friendship a uh, bad rapport in business? Good question. Um, frankly, I think it can flip both ways um, at times. You can end up working with a friend and before you know it, anything's possible. I'm, I'm not saying that's impossible. What I'm saying is, from my own personal experience, working with friends has not really worked out for me. I've lost all four friends that I started or tried to work with. Uh, we don't talk till today. And if we were to sit down and ask what really went wrong, we can't really say what it was. But it bored bad blood between the two of us, or between myself and my friends. Yes, you've got successful companies that were founded by friends. You do get one-offs. But in general, I'm sure I'm not alone when I say starting a company with a friend ends up being fairly tricky because drawing a line sometimes on what needs to be done and by when it needs to be done by. Say, for instance, um, your, your project timelines. Your friend who was supposed to do something by a certain date, they've been dropping the ball consistently. How do you approach it? My friend is dropping the ball consistently. There's only so many ways you can go around the situation diplomatically. Mm. Otherwise, just call the bullshit and say, hey, what's going on? And if they're not the right person for the job, how do you start firing a friend? I think you just fire them. Clean. That's the end of your friendship. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let me ask you. Um, you see, the point is also you've had the ability to stop them, right? Uh, or rather, you've had the ability to stop bad things when they happen. But, you know, I mean, I'll take this a bit out of context, right? But a lot of, I'm a researcher, and one thing a lot of people have come to discover is even the reason why people stay in bad marriages, right? In an abusive relationship is because they've sunk too much time in this whole idea, and therefore they must continue doing it. I mean, at what point? I'll stop you there. Um, <laughs> but let me just finish. At what point do you realize that? Uh, I mean, you've had three businesses as well. So, at what point do you realize that you need to stop? You, you have to be honest with yourself. One a company is not a place for social networking. It's a place to get stuff done and make money. We're not. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm. I'm I don't. I'm, I'm not in the um, the charity environment. I'm here to make uh, money and make an impact, and that's the whole point of entrepreneurship and it's fun um, and if you're going to get into a business and start mulling around as to oh you know they're my pal I don't know what I'm going to do then entrepreneurship is not for you um, because you just have to be blunt and there's a certain level of lack of patience entrepreneurs should have with non-performing bits and bobs within the organization just drop them um, it's not it shouldn't be as complex but I understand your uh, the, the 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 point you've brought in, and it's very, it's very dangerous. I mean, you've 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 walked into marriage and abusive relationships, which I have nothing, uh, no knowledge about. But what I do have an idea about is just saying enough. And life is too short for you to be dragging one another and be like, hey, you know, I know you messed up, but I'll give you another second chance. And this time it's chance number ten. But yet the company is not going anywhere, and you're constantly making excuses for your friend as to why they're not performing. So just call, call the bullshit and, and, and avoid dragging one another through unnecessary um, emotional turmoil. Okay, so um, if most of you got this, oh, there are questions. Um, hi, my name is Wamboy. Uh, I'm a CEO of my own design company. Excellent. Um, so before we create a situation where you see your, your friend and you are coming up with an idea and then you're like, oh my God, I, I'm not going to do this. I mean, what could, could what could be done to mitigate the whole I'm thinking is, you know, one thing Kenyans don't do is sign contracts. We don't. We, we come up with great ideas in Java and then we are off to make money and then there was no contract, there was no you, job You're talking about it right there. That's me. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying. I've, I've also experienced similar things. So, I mean, it's a behavior we have where we just don't do paperwork. Yeah. And I would, be, I would be able to fire my friend if I'm like, this is your job description and you haven't done any of it, you know. These are your targets, you haven't met them. Mm -hmm. So maybe I think the thing we need to get into is 
we need to start signing paperwork and being very serious about it because yeah, true. that would mitigate. Otherwise, we're going to lose a lot of friends at this rate. <laughs> I agree with you, yes. Uh, yeah, we need to. Hey. How are you doing? Not too bad. How are you doing? Good to see you. Likewise. Congratulations on uh, Umanti. I know you just got some good money into it. Thank you. Um, but the biggest problem, I guess, is, is you know human nature, is that every success story can be reverse engineered into a series of, I did this, then I did this, and I did this, and I decided to do this. I mean, that's, you know, neat set of decisions and so on. And we all know that's not the case. Looking back, you can laugh about it, you can compress it into short stories. I'd like you to tell us, I mean, I remember when Rupu launched, forgive me, Makikuyu, that has to be taken slowly. Um, you launched with an offer for an iPhone. Yeah. yeah. True? So um, which means partly true. Go ahead. Yes, I remember. So um, you had, you started big, which means there was a lot of work that went into it beforehand before we actually got to see it. Correct. And you give us an anecdote, a story yeah. of in that process. Yeah. You know, a day you couldn't sleep because your house was locked or something. You know, some mistake you made, one or two of them that yeah. you made and have stuck with you through the five years yeah. that you've been in business? Simple, work-life balance. I nearly lost my mind when I started Rupu. In fact, there's one of my founding team members in here by the corner, Alan Matata. Um, he will tell you, when we started Rupu, we literally used to sleep in the office. The cleaners would come into the office at six in the morning to start doing their work. and they literally find Minuto and his team drooling from his mouth with sleep. They're like, oh, we'll make it my pema. We're like, no. And the shock on their face to see a director or CEO of a company sleeping in the office to keep doing the same thing over and over again was unheard of. And I wish I took some time off because I lost so much during that time. And especially to do with family. Uh, my, my younger sister um, and my mom are all still based in London and I, I barely spoke to them. And I was that brother, that son that was in Kenya, in Africa for about six, eight months and they barely spoke to me. Work, life, balance. As much as you put in the effort, please take time to recharge your batteries. I know some companies will tell you otherwise or some theories will tell you otherwise, but I damn near nearly lost my mind during Rupu. And when we launched, um, just to correct you, we didn't launch with an iPhone. And anybody who's doing e-commerce in here, please stick to one thing, guerrilla marketing. Avoid mainstream marketing. Think about how you can capture your target audience without spending a single dollar on marketing. So to answer your question, the iPhone 4, we're giving out four iPhone 4s um, one day a week for four days. What did you need to do to get it? Simple. Sign up onto Rupu, buy a deal, tell us why you deserve it. That shut up our signups like nearly 200% in a week. And at that time, we were still doing, uh, it was towards December. And um, I remember a tweet coming in from Nigeria. Who the hell are these guys giving out iPhone 4s? And all we did was, hey, guys, can we be authentic in our marketing? Can we say, if you do this for me as my target audience, I'll give you this in return. No gimmicks, no games. So we gave out iPhone 4s consecutively. And the moment that lasted with me and resonates with me very well was a lady by the name of Nina Ndichu. We, we played a prank on her. On the last day, we were giving out iPhone 4s. Uh, it's the same time we were sponsoring Saudi Soul, uh, the new album Soul Philosophy at the time. So we had the audience and we said, hey, can we have one of you guys from Saudi Soul come over to us? We'll play a prank on one of our customers. So it was called Polycap, the guy who plays bass. So Polycap came over. I told Polycap, hide in the room. So we're going to tell this poor young lady that on the last day, she's come to pick up her iPhone 4. They're kind of like seven winners for the same phone. And she had been stuck in traffic for two hours. At that time, Kibaki was moving around Nairobi. So the look on her face first was priceless when we put her into a boardroom. She really wanted to kill me instantly. 
And that was for us a way to guerrilla market to an individual who has walked, who has traveled two hours to come and interact with your brand. So we sat on the boardroom table. There were five people from Rupu. She didn't know anyone. And there was poor her. So at the time, the CEO came into the room, says, hey, hey, Nina, hey, guys, just want to tell you there are seven winners. And we all made sure we looked at her. She looked like death. She was like, whoa, I need to kill these Africans. And then we said to her, hey, 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 we can play a game to establish who's going to win the iPhone 4. She had no choice but to say yes. And guess what game it was? Spin the bottle. So you had some grown folks during the day, no alcohol, playing spin the bottle. So we spanned the damn thing, and it landed on Nina. And we couldn't hold our laughter anymore. We started laughing. But she thought she was still part of the game. And she was still so pissed off that when Polycap walked in to give her the iPhone, she was still laughing at us, not realizing the joke's on her. So we asked her, hey, Nina, did you, did you look around and see who gave you the phone? She turned around and started screaming. I was like, whoa. I want to be a bass player in a, in a rock band. <laughs> and then since that day, ever since, every time we have a person on social media who didn't understand what Rupa was, guess who jumped in on our behalf without paying her? Nina Ditchu. Until this very day, she remembers that moment. So back to my comment, work-life balance. Perhaps if I didn't have work, if I did have work-life balance, I may not have thought about that, but that was a, an experience that I'd, I wouldn't want to repeat. I try and rest as much as you work. So work hard and rest hard, I guess. Uh, do you have any tips on how to write that bit of a problem, of work-life balance? What do you mean, write the bit? Write, as in, how do you make it right? Yeah, I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you find time to sleep? Yeah, how do you make yourself, you know, just get away from it all? Another mistake I did is, which is related to what you said, is n not letting go. I, I found myself doing everything. And as, a, as an entrepreneur, and a, as, a, as an owner of the business, I'm sure you understand, um, you'd want to be part of everything that you do to make sure it's done right. And if you don't let go early enough, you'll end up being the only person who runs your company. And when you're off ill or you just want to take time off, your business operations go south. How do you switch off? We all have different ways of switching off, and we're all individuals. My way of switching off is going to the gym, running, spending time with my family, um, my fiancé, spending time with my nieces and my nephew. It's important to spend time with kids because they kind of put stuff into perspective. The things that you take so seriously, they don't. And the more time you spend with them, you realize, actually, it's never that serious at times. And it's also important to spend... I, a friend of mine once said to me, it's important to spend time with people who are six years and below and 60 and above. You get a very different perspective of life. The conversation levels you have with a five-year-old or four-year-old are very different than what you'd have with your colleagues. It kind of helps you switch off a little bit, well, for me. And my grandmother, I have conversations with her about my business. Until this very day, she goes, I keep seeing that company you talked about. You're still running it. So before I explained to her, no, sure, sure, I sold it. But Cavado, I bought something else. Oh, but you're still running it, eh? So I've got my own way of switching off, which is just, I go running. Um, I know it may not show. Um, but I, I try and work out as well. And spend time with loved ones. Because with loved ones, you can't BS your way around them. They kind of remind you where things started from. Okay, we've got a few questions. Uh, you, you started telling us about your story, how you went from Mokong to Rupu to Umati. Yeah. I'd really like to hear about Rupu from the beginning and what the grind was during Rupu and the mistakes. Damn, the grind. There's so many. I don't know where to start. From the beginning. Um, so... Just to make sure I understand your question, do you want to know, wh what exactly would you like to know about Rupu? Uh, from, from inception, from the idea to raising funding to, well, you've mentioned about the team a bit, okay. and then to actually getting traction, what are the challenges there until All right. now? Cool. 
So, as I mentioned before, I, I grew up in Mombasa. So when I came back from London, the first place I wanted to set up was Mombasa because I knew it. Um, and when I did set up in Mombasa, it took about a year and a half. No salary, no cash coming into my account. I thought I was literally going to go mad. Um, then one day, I got a lucky break. So a friend of mine said, hey, um, I've got my friend who I went to university with. This is in England. And the father is coming to Africa. And they, he wants to talk to you. He wants to talk to potential entrepreneurs. Back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, God, here goes another incident where I'm trying to parade myself to get some cash. Not for those reasons that you're thinking. Um, so I met my mentor. It's called Thomas Troop. So Thomas was the um, uh, head of emerging markets for Ringier. Ringier is a company that owns Rupu today. And Rupu since we started. And Thomas said to me, hey, uh, tell me a bit, a bit about yourself. So I sold myself. I traveled from Mombasa. I said to him, I'm here on my own buck. I could barely afford to get to Nairobi. Um, and this is my idea. So the idea that I had was um, Rupu Shops, which was closed the other day, but it was simply equivalent to Jumuya. So that's the idea I had of Rupu. He says to me, okay, cool, great. Um, so who's your team? At that time, I had dragged my poor friend from Mombasa. I'm like, dude, come, come, come. We're doing a presentation, so look smart, okay? And his name is Alan over there, amongst three other individuals. So we took him to Barclays Prestige Banking on Waiyaki Way. So I had a connection to give me access to that room because I had to present myself as, you know, somebody reputable. He had to respect me. So we presented the Rupu shops and all the numbers. He looks at the board and he's like, Ah, I like this. I said, okay. He says, um, I'm going to invest. I was like, sorry? He says, yeah, but before I do so, could you multiply the marketing numbers by four? I was like, okay. He says, perfect. He says, so who's flying to Switzerland to sign the paperwork? I was like, did I miss something? But before I knew it, um, I was literally on a flight to Zurich to sign the documents to start a itty bitty small company that we didn't really know the name. And a week later, I came back to Nairobi and they asked me, so Minutu, how much do you need to start this company of yours? I said, oh, well, from our numbers, we need about $72,000. She says, okay, um, I'll get my personal assistant to send it to you. I was thinking, are you kidding me? Two days later, there was $72,000 in my personal account. I said to him, this guy knew what made him think he could give me this cash? What if I was from West Africa? I'm not going to name the country. <laughs> I could go missing and he would never know who I was. So I had that moment to prove to him that I was legitimate and I was right for the money. At that time, we didn't know what we were going to create, but we just knew it was e-commerce based. I had no idea as to how to run an e-commerce company. So I'll tell you that now. I was my first time running an e-commerce firm. But all I knew is that I, had, I believed I had the right team, people who had the right spirit and the right um, mindset to start your company. Um, so we were a team of about six people, and I had it all mapped out in my head. I was like, yes, I've got a personal assistant. I've got an IT guy who's going to manage the computers if they go wrong. I've got a marketing person. I've got a salesperson. We're good. So he says, so... Uh, What's the name of your company? I was like, well, we haven't thought about that yet. So he flew down my co-founder. And at the time, my co-founder, um, till today, he's called Leandro Sanchez. He's an Argentinian. So there's a lot of press uh, where a lot of people think co-founder is also Kenyan. But my co-founder is Argentinian. He had just sold his company to Ringier for $20 million. When he told me that, I was like, tell me whatever you want to know, and I'm taking it today. I'm a sponge. I'm taking in all the knowledge you have. So he came to me and he said, hey, have you heard of something called Groupon? I was like, what? And this is in 2010. And he says to me, what rock do you live under? I said, I beg your pardon. Do you know where you are? You're in Africa. So you better watch your mouth. He says, no, no, no offense. And we've actually sat over there when he told me this in the IHOM. So he showed me the website. He explained the business model. And he says, tell you what, think on it. Let me know if you want to do this. I was like, no, 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 no. I don't have to think about anything. So I asked him, are you sure this starts making money from day one? 
He's like, yeah. He said, we're doing it. And that was the birth of the model called Rupu. But we still didn't have a name. So we went back to the office. I told the guys, I've spoken to a very clever, short Argentinian who knows what we should do. I nearly lost the faith of my team. But I managed to convince them that, hey, this is the best idea. So we sat down as a team, and I can advise anyone, please always run and try and run a democratic company as much as possible. Avoid the autocratic ways of a traditional African business where you tell people what to do. Please explain to them why it needs to be done and make them be part of the decision-making process. So we came up with the name Rupu, and does anybody know what Rupu means? Yeah, same thing that happened in the room. Rupu is actually a Swahili word. It's from Swahili uh, Sanifu for the word discount. If you put Rupu together, you get Marupu Rupu. It means something completely different. Those are fringe benefits. But Rupu means discount. No, not many people know that. So a week later, we had the name Rupu. And I remember the pressure we were under to launch Rupu. We launched it in five weeks after finding the name. Five damn weeks. It turned out that that was the fastest a company has ever been launched under Ringier standards. So we launched the company even before it was formed legally. And we launched it here at the iHub. I remember our lawyers in Kenya calling me and swearing at me on the phone. Like, what are you doing? You can get sued and you can get arrested. I was like, calm down. This is entrepreneurship. So just to let everybody know, when we started Rupu, do you want to take a guess how many other group buying platforms were in the market at the time? Anyone? None? One? There were three. We were the last to come in. Exactly. We were the last to come in, and we had to prove to the market that we were the first. So again, word of advice to anyone who's launching a company, drown out the noise of your, entre of your competitors as soon as possible. So we did that within two months, and that was the launch of Rupu, a team of six people. And as far as people were concerned, Rupu was a team of 50, financed to the tune of $20 million by some random Europeans. But all we had was $300,000, which is quite a lot looking back. One of the mistakes I made was selling a lot of shares early. I'll tell you now that I've sold the company. I sold, I gave up a lot of shares to start Rupu. And the mindset was very simple. I better have a small slice of a very large cake than having a large slice of a very tiny cake. But what that advice didn't really work out for me was when I realized I literally had no say in the company despite running it, despite creating it, despite putting everything together. And in the end, after about three years, I one thing I regret was not making the decision to leave uh, faster. Because that's the other disadvantage. I'd like to be really honest with all the entrepreneurs in this room. Um, before you get investors, be very careful, both local and international investors. Um, but the downside of local investors is they may not understand your business because you're either running something that's slightly beyond them, but they have faith in what you're doing. The other downside of working with foreign investors is that they perceive you as not clued up to your local market. So they end up making decisions about what happens here from over there. Now, they forget that we are people about relationships. We are people about meeting one another. We are very communal rather than transactional. You can bring a product to Kenya and it may be the best thing since sliced bread. But if you don't have the right relationships and the right partnerships, it's not going to fly. Unlike the West. In Europe and the West, you bring up a good product, it's not about relationships anymore. It's does it make sense to the people and that will fly. So one painful mistake I made was giving out too much equity in the beginning because at the time, I literally, I literally didn't have any um, options. I was running low on cash and I wanted to survive. So I gave up quite a lot. With that said, I didn't have any other option. So that was Rupu until I sold. So I sold the company about a year and a half ago, Joy. A year and a half ago. 
sorry, Joy is the head of finance at um, Ringier, that owns Rupi. And someone I hold with a lot of respect. Um, then shortly after I sold it, I knew I needed to start a new company called Umati. How that came about was again, Eric Herzman. He kept saying to me, when, you two, when are you going to do something that will go out of Kenya? I'm like, leave me alone, Eric. I'm doing something good. It's called Rupal. So at that time, we were pretty popular. And he kept, for four months, he kept bugging me. He's like, dude, when are you going to do something meaningful? I was like, what are you trying to say about Rupal? He's like, don't get emotional. I'm just being honest with you. So one day, I called Eric up and I was like, hey, let's do this thing, whatever you call it. He goes, all right. So we sat down, and that was when Omati Capital was born. So to give you an idea, what Omati Capital does is we're a non-banking financial institution. What we do is very simple. We lend out to institutions such as SMEs. Um, and to be particular, we lend out to the dairy sector within agriculture. So what we've done is said, okay, you've got the agri-dairy industry, which has a gazillion amount of farmers who come together under what you call cooperatives, aka uh, farming business organizations. We put in technology at the farmer level to understand how much milk is contributed by each farmer every day according to the co-op. Now we can lend to the co-op who then by in turn lends to the farmers or we can lend to the farmers directly using our partnership with Airtel and in the future our own prepaid cards. So farming or, in, or dairy is our first industry and so far it's been pretty cool. Um, I didn't give up enough. I didn't give up too much equity to our investors. We raised quite a bit of cash, more than I could believe sometimes. But um, it's been a, an emotional roller coaster, and I want to say I'm always available via email to anybody who wants to get um, information about what it's like to start a company with sometimes nothing to managing investors. Because I believe we've had a very um, torrid uh, time with our investors uh, before we decided to settle on who we have right now. Uh, in the email that was sent out, you said that you had ignored the role of mentors in your path. The role of mentors? I don't know. It was something. Betty, I'll what was it that. about? No Started out with no mentors. I mean, how did that, did that affect you adversely in your first venture? I'm very stubborn. Um, my fiance will tell you that. And what I didn't want when I came to Kenya was to allow somebody to say, or oh, because I used their network, is for them to say, see that young man? I made him into who he is today. So I wanted to do it by myself. I didn't use a cent of my family network or, fr or friends, actually. I did it all alone. And there's a sense of achievement one gets when you do that. And when you reach to a point and say, you look back, nobody can say, I made you or I built who you are. And that has a lot of traction with so many people that you meet. Not that you have to keep repeating it, but they can tell because they will never have heard, yeah, they got a, a leg up from so-and-so. I'm not saying you, you don't take advantage of your networks. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is I wish I had a, I, I was humble enough to take a mentor in. But as I look back, I'm pretty proud for about where I am being self-made. Self, self so it wasn't about lack of availability. It was about you basically saying no. Yeah. Okay. But tell us about the e-commerce industry in this country. What does it take to get to the level of Ruku? Because from what we know about Kenyans, yeah, they lack trust. I mean, it's touch first by later so i mean how how did you go about the stereo is it what is it yeah let's say the stereotypes that kenyans had about online business and how did you manage to get enough traction to be able to build the company that it is today persistence um and it's important to have a deep pocketed investor while you keep doing your trials to ensure that the business model works so i'm not going to ignore the fact that I had investors who weren't pressuring me to break even quickly, step one. Step two, um, it's just patience. I remember when I first launched Rupu, we had one of our sales guys um, go to Mombasa to try and launch Rupu in Mombasa. Mombasa was so bad, he got arrested 
when he went to El Corpo to sell a deal to the owners of El Corpo. So I remember he calling us at about maybe 2 p.m. on a random December in 2010. And he says, guys, I've been arrested. I was like, what for? He goes, some guys here think I'm, I'm a con man. I said, what do you mean you've been arrested? And he said, all he remembers was, he was talking to the owner of El Corpo, explaining to them what Rupu is. And the owner said, just stay there one minute. <laughs> Went to the back of the restaurant, called the cops, came back to keep my sales guy busy until the cop arrived. And when the cop arrived, this guy in El Corpo said, and he shouted, this guy's a con man. And the cop didn't, the cop's the last person you're going to try and explain group on, group buying model to. He doesn't care. So we had to get him out. And what I'm trying to get at here is there was a lack of trust from even local businesses about how the whole group buying works. And for those that don't understand how Rupu works, it's very simple. What we used to say, or looking back, is you tell a business, I'm not going to charge you a single penny to list your service or your product online. However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bust my ass and make sure I make a sale. And from every sale I make, I'm going to take a commission of that successful sale. The business is like, hey, if you don't make a sale, it's free for me to advertise on your platform. The answer is yes. But if you do make a sale, I'll take 50%. A lot of businesses were like, uh, I'm not too sure about that. And we had to start at the lower margin um, before we built up to 50%. And then when competition came in, we had to go back down to 25%. Um, how did we go about buying trust? I guess I kept telling my team, the thing that we're doing is we're not doing e-commerce here. We're, 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 we're trust merchants. We're selling trust online. If you came to Rupo at the time, what would we have to show you for us to gain your confidence that that deal is live and is real? Number one, phone number of the person of that business, so that when you make that call to say, hey boss, Nimona Rupu, is it for real? The guys would say, yeah, it's for real. In fact, I'm doing a deal with them. The other is ample pictures to describe the deal. So if we're talking about a massage and wherever it is, we need to convince you, one, it's not gonna end in a happy, there's no happy ending, number one. And two, it's of a reputable environment. And number three, we had to have a support team that was ready. Support team on social media, on Facebook and on Twitter to respond to some of the doubting Thomases that would say, hey, I don't believe that deal's live. And as, as you recall, I mentioned about this young lady called Nina Ndichu. We had multiple individuals such as those. And what we did to gain their trust is to make sure they had a very good positive experience from the minute they saw the deal to when they bought the deal and after. So in case they had a very negative experience, how do we deal with it? You can't back off and say, hey, 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 it's between you and the business you're going to buy from. It's got nothing to do with us. We can't do that, and we couldn't do that. I remember one of the mistakes I did on live TV was I gave out my phone number because one of our customers had an issue, and he called NTV when I was having an interview. He says, yeah, my wife, uh, they had a problem with their dealer, and there's no support until today. I was like, all right, here's my number. I'll deal with it personally. Because that's the level at which we had to go to prove that we were legit. Yes, by the time I got on my phone, I had like 300 calls. But I still managed to get that guy's number, solve the problem. And that's the other thing. Just be human. You know, we're not, don't hide behind an organization thinking that you know, you'll sort things out because, hey, you know, it's a company. If you don't see me, I'm good. Just get shit done. Give the customer a good experience. And if you keep repeating that, in Kenya and in Africa, word of mouth starts to market for itself. Okay. But how about uh, Mokom? You mentioned that you sold Rupu. Yeah. But what happened to that first business? Oh, it's like a... <laughs> what stopped? Or oh, what's the mistake? It's like a bad relationship, huh? A lingering relationship. Um, it literally dissolved. And it was so emotional to me because that was my first venture, first real venture. And until this day, we haven't really shut the company down. Yeah, it's just two emotions right there. Um, what happened to it? It stopped trading. Um, the minute I left Mombasa, because I was literally the salesperson of the business. Um, I had a proud moment when I started Mokum Wireless 
uh, literally walked into one of the bank managers of, uh, yeah, I'll say the bank name, Fina Bank in Mombasa. I walked in and I was like, hey, dude, I need to open a bank account. I was like, the only reason I'm going to trust you is because you speak funny. <laughs> Otherwise, do you have the documents to start the company? I was like, nah, can we overlook that for now? I'll give you the money. So we managed to get um, a connection to get us the bank account because we hadn't formed the company as yet. Um, and over the months, I kept going back to him and be like, hey, you, you do asset financing, right? He goes, yeah, can I get some cash? No. I was like, whoa, I'm a customer. He says, you're not really a customer per se. I did you a favor. I said, okay. So I went away for a year, and one random day we went back and we said to him, hey, 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 we've been doing quite a lot of um, installations in Mombasa. So we had about 17 hotels across uh, North Coast, Mombasa, Malindi, and uh, Diani. So we went back to the bank, and the guy opened our account. And I'll never forget that day. He opened the account with his normal blase nature, you know, leaning back. He goes, so, uh, what's your account number? Looks at the account. It's like, whoa, one second. He dropped, he dropped what he was doing. He picks up the phone. Stay where you are. Uh, uh, we need to speak to some Kijanos over here now. It turns out that we had sales of about $40,000 in one year. And I was so much in the grind, no paycheck, that I didn't take a minute to look up and see and ask, what is, what's our sales? And I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs here understand that feeling when it's like you're drowning, but you just know you have to keep going. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. You have to keep going and get to it. I advise you, and this is one of the mistakes, take a minute, take a breather, Get up and see how far you've gone. Look back and say, and, and be honest with yourself and be like, where have I got into based on my milestones? And that was what changed it for me. It gave me a lot of confidence that I actually knew what I was talking about. And I knew it was time for me to fly out the nest and start something new. But at what point did it stop? Uh, Mocom stop? Mm. It hasn't. Oh, so it's... <laughs> Any questions? Um, I can go ahead, yeah. yeah. Sure. So, uh, my name is Hope. I run a media company. We produce content. Um, I wanted to take you back to the earlier conversation on work-life balance. Um, and it's a comment stroke equation. Okay. So, I'll, I'll, I mean, I have the same sentiments as you. I don't remember my 20s because I spend them mad in work working crazy hours is trying to put a business up yeah. and it's one of my biggest regrets as well yeah i lost so much family time my health and it's something i've sworn i'll never do again in my exactly. life exactly yeah but however um the flip side of the coin i will ask um is there any other way to really do a startup because yes i look back and go like oh man was this a crazy time no sleep no you know just very crazy but is there any other way in the beginning years of anyone who's doing a new company, yeah. the first two, one, two, three years, four years are just really crazy. Is I'd there really yeah. any other method of doing it differently? Yes, now I know I do it differently. I'm in a new startup again. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing it differently, but really it's because of that experience. All right, I get it. Um, I'll tell you how I did it. And I oh, appreciate it. Yes. What was the third that you've been trying to debate her with your point? Besides Z2 and Group, what, I mean, Rupu, what was the other company? There was the a company one? called My Shilling. I never heard of it. Yeah. And there's a company called Sokopal. Then we had Mokality Deals after Rupu. Yeah. So do you answer your first question? I'll tell you how I did it. Yes. Um, I lost a lot. A hell of a lot. And as I look back, everything happens for a reason. I'm not going to try and change um, what happened. But what I've done differently now I've searched for lunatics who had my mindset as I did back then and I put them to the task of starting a company. So I manage a bunch of lunatics at the moment and I try and manage their work ethic. Um, one popular mindset I always have is I like to work like an immigrant. Um, the immigrant work ethic, uh, no offense uh, to anybody, but the immigrant work ethic means that you always compensate for stuff that you don't know by the effort. 
Um, so in Umati Capital, my job now becomes managing my team to avoid them burning out. I can see the hunger and I can see the craziness they have. And it's the same that I did. But if I get into the same burnout mode as them, it would be the blind leading the blind. So my trick is to hire a bunch of lunatics and manage them. Hello. Uh, shout, shout. Wait, wait. Okay. okay. Um, hey. Hello. Hey. Hello. It's here. Oh, okay. It's me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The corner, huh? All right. Um, my name is Abdurrahman. Nice and, to meet you. Um, I should I should never have been here. I never heard about you guys. And uh, let me tell you before I said anything with you how I end up here. Uh, that lady who's sitting behind her with the glass. She meet me at the Mexican place. I was eating my burrito. Uh, and I will tell you why I want to eat the burrito. Hey. Yeah, I will tell you. But the interesting thing is that she told me there's some conference and I asked her, because she looked good and I asked her, you know, what's going on in this place? Yeah? That's what I'm saying, hey. <laughs> <coughs> so she told me there's something going on here and I just end up, you know, you pay 500 shilling and I pay my 500 shilling and I never heard about you. I never had any of you guys. Okay. <coughs> but it was beautiful to come here because I feel like a family, big family. Yeah. I mean, really, really. Let me start it why I come here and eat burritos. Yeah. Mr. Re- P? Yeah, the reason why I eat burritos, the Mexican food, I started two weeks ago, two plays at the junction, food court. Yeah. Two weeks ago. Yeah. Sunday. And uh, one of them is an Italian ice cream gelato with 24 different uh, flavor with ice cream. The other one I started is Mexican food and smooth and juice, fresh smooth and juice. So I was not having my burrito when I eat. And a week ago, I was driving here and I saw the name of the Mexican. I said, let me just go to that place. Yeah. I work for the UN also, it's extra. So I come from a job, draw my place, and say, let me just go to that place and see their burritos compared to mine. Uh, I have been here in Kenya one, two and a half years. And uh, those two and a half years, 20 years I was in the dark. And in Nairobi, I was one and a half years. In the last six months, I started three companies. One is a roasting company called Nova Roasting Coffee at the Longa Longa. And the two places now here. And everything you say about, she said about family, Friends, it seems like I come home in uh, I mean, a feeling that, I mean, I mean, how you lost your family, your friends, and everyone else, you know. And to me, being an entrepreneur is like listening to your guts, not rationality, most of the times. My rationality comes after my guts. Yeah? That's when I try to solve the problems, if I can solve the problems. But it's amazing to see tonight, you know, and I will never forget again, you know, that you have a bunch of these people here, you know, who all of them are trying to be their best, you know. We need more entrepreneurs in Africa and less politicians. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. So I have another question from here. Yeah. Um, now, now it's that way. Yeah, yeah. So we started um, one year ago a company called Infinity Space. Called? Infinity Space. Okay, what do you um, do? So, at the time, uh, we had a robotics project, and then over the, over the while, like eight months, we changed. So now we have uh, we shop up, which is basically an e-commerce platform. Okay. So I'm so happy to be here and listening to your story about Rupo and everything, and we are just starting. Okay. And we're getting like uh, ready for our Series A funding. Good. So, my question uh, goes to back then, when you're starting your first company, you started with your friends, and yeah, I have that experience. I told some other friends, and some of them didn't believe in me, so they left. Yeah. But our team has been distributed, and we are, we are now eight, but we started like six, and only two in Kenya, uh, three in France, and one in Cameroon. Okay. And it's been one year, and we've still been strong, 
no making any revenue, no nothing. Yeah. Um, I know the feeling. Yeah. So, yeah, and everybody keeps, you know, where are you, where are you? So, but my question is, uh, um, how does, um, do you think process, uh, process inside the, inside your startup or in your company, let's say following like lean, um, lean methodology. Yeah. Do you think that can impact, um, you know, that bad um, relationship with your co-founders? Like, how do you delegate tasks and, you know, exactly. yeah. the flow? Yeah. Because we have had this situation where two of, two of us in the company, we feel like we do everything. We've uh, experienced already two burnouts. Yeah. So I personally, until I changed, so I've only had it once. But yeah. My co-founder, just before... So today we're mm. pitching at Waira in UK. Yeah. But he couldn't make it because he burned out yeah. and he had to ad- um, undergo a surgery. And I mean, even if he stops, that does that that doesn't mean that the company stops. Yeah. So do you think, um, as you said, that when you left, the company went down. Yeah. So do you think that process, if applied in a startup, will make um that bad relationship like everybody is contributing into the team equally yeah um first hats off to you um thank you i truly admire uh, sticking it in even a year after you're not making revenue it, it can be fairly demoralizing but there are obviously other things that will tell you you're heading the right direction so to answer your question um do i think processes are necessary when you're when you're starting a business with friends is that your question Absolutely. Th- that's the constitution of the business. You agree. And um, uh, one of our, uh, you mentioned about um, a job description, um, about who's doing what and why and when it's going to be done. I remember when I first started Rupert with my, co- my co-founding team, the CEO at the time, um, he kept complaining that I was doing part of his job as well, which was true. Um, because you're constantly firefighting stuff to make sure it works. And you're always worried that something is not happening how it's supposed to be, and that's why you have to be there. If you have a problem with your co-founders or your team and you don't feel like they're pulling their weight, chop off that relationship. The earlier and the sooner, the better. It's painful, yes, but the sooner, the better, because the company is being pegged back in terms of performance. If you get a performing individual, the company will be really far ahead. And I'd like to repeat and say to you, entrepreneurship is a very lonely um, environment to be in. You won't have your typical friends that you can go out and hang out with and drink till 2 or 3 in the morning because they don't look at what the, the world the same as you do. You're not here for fun and games and let's not think about tomorrow. Your world becomes your business because you're saying, hey, I want my kids, I want my grandkids, I want my grand- grandkids to see this and to at least benefit from what I do. Very few people will sit in the same light and you will see yourself drifting from your so-called friends because one, you stop hanging out with them. Two, you're in constant disagreement about what makes sense in life. And don't be scared to do, to do it and go it alone. I kept saying to myself, I came to this world alone and I'm going to check out alone. When I'm here, I'm going to do things how I see fit because life is way too short um and that was made very apparent to me in march with my fiance when we were robbed at gunpoint and we were tied up for four hours and literally around the corner here and it woke us up to a lot of the things that we're doing within the business community do them and snap off anyone and anything that's holding you back having a no my my mentor is just, my motto is just having um, no survivors. I nobody survives around when I'm trying to get stuff done and you're holding me back. I'll explain to you nicely why we need to get it done. If you don't adhere to what I'm trying to tell you and it makes sense to you, but yet you feel like you've got your own way of doing things, I'll let you be. I'll go about my own business. So lastly, yeah. Um, as as a, as a leader, so like you know company history and how we started so basically it's been me and the and the other guy in France so 
do you think it's our role to guide the, the other team members into their roles? Because one thing I noticed, um, apart from the leading the um, our, our company, I've also been a community manager with the Google Developer Group. And I noticed when I'm the leader, I need to like define everything. So you know you have to lead and delegate tasks. So you get to understand that not everybody is able to think like you yeah. in and see everything yeah. like yeah. you. Yeah. So do you think also you um you or also us failed in leading the team because in understanding how people work and being able to guide them into the real um, um task they're supposed to do. You d you weren't able to discover where they fit. You get yes, I'm, I completely agree. I felt like a new parent, um, and Rupa was my first baby. Um, I'm none the wiser of, as to how things are supposed to be done. All I know is one speed, madness. Just keep going. Looking back, that's one of the biggest mistakes I did, which is a lack of leadership within my team in the early stage because one of our guys burnt out, a uh, young man by the name of Joshua Musao. Joshua, from working consecutive nights at the office, developed a rash from the tip of his right hand to his shoulder, and the rash didn't go away. He went to hospital, just didn't go away, it came with a fever as well. It turned out Joshua was burning out. We had to put Joshua, send him home, call his other half and tell him, do not let that guy leave. And as I look back, it was, it was modus operandi to give it all. Huh? But now as I look back, it didn't serve some of us well. Our CTO, a young man by the name of Charles Kithika, he took his first leave after nearly two years because you needed systems to be up and running. So yes, one of the mistakes I did was, without knowing, is not being a good leader to understand when I can pick out burnout before it happens. Because when that happens, it can be irreversible. The damage can be irreversible. And it's not worth it when you look at it, when you put your health uh, before your business. But again, back to your comment, um, you don't know where to draw the line. It's like, how? How do you stop? How do you pull back the brakes? If it's your first venture, how do you pull back the brakes? Yet you've got investors to impress. You've got shareholders to impress. You've got stakeholders to impress as well you know no speed other than just madness so you just i think it's you hope and pray it works out in your favor and i'm not saying i have the right formula to start an e-commerce company or run a successful company i don't it just the coin flipped in my favor in this case where i didn't go mad because i literally was losing it very little sleep go back to the office planning for the next day's pitch who am i going to pitch to why am I pitching to them? What am I going to say to them? I need to get this business and lock it in. So I have a question about that. If it's if it's so mad and at times it can get really bad, why have you done it three times? I know nothing else. <laughs> I think some of us could say that too. Uh, any okay, other so questions? Me too. Oh. Uh, hey, um, you mentioned that the one thing that you know really well about is managing people. And you've talked yeah. a lot. Yeah, you've talked a lot about managing team. Yeah. But now talk about managing investors. Yeah. You, you talked about how you got money for Rupa. That was like a lucky break. Probably would happen to the rest of us. Yeah. But how how have you managed investors and probably tie that into Umati and how you raised the last round? Wow. All right. Interesting question. Um, it's important to have somebody who balances or complements what you are as an uh, as a as a founder, because this person would help you see the flip side of the coin. I came from an environment where I was negatively affected by foreign investors. So I had a zero, t zero tolerance approach to BS. Oh, we believe your company is going to go places if you work with us, blah, 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 blah. My focus was simple. I'm going to grow my company. I'll try and bootstrap it as much as possible. The lean uh, approach is my Bible, including the business model canvas. It's my Bible. Um, Wow, you can see how passionate I am about this topic about investors. What was your question again? Yeah, okay. 
I'm still passionate about um, that. How I manage investors. I'll tell you a story about Umati Kaplan. Uh, it's a true story. It's what happened. So about a year ago, we were working with um, um, American investors, and they did their due diligence on Umati. It was fantastic, and they valued us at a very, very, very handsome uh, valuation. But they said to us one thing: "Hey guys, um, we really like your business. It makes sense. The founding team is fantastic. One of one half of the company has worked for Citibank for eight years, so they're solid on the finance side. The other half is a techpreneur who's launched something that." Is still around to prove that you know I know what I'm talking about, but they said ah you like leverage, so what we're going to do we're going to give you very very strict terms, and on the term sheet uh, there were three terms that we didn't like. These are what you call your one year cliff. What a one year cliff means is that if something happens to you within the one year, your shares don't really go back to your estate; they are taken by the investor. And they said, oh, these are standard terms for where we come from. I said, okay. And another clause they had was a four-year vesting uh, clause. And they said, this is standard across our investments. I said, okay, explain to me, what does it mean? They said, well, technically, after four years, every year the company goes right by, we'll give you back your shares back to you. I was like, hold on a second. So you're coming in as a minority investor, but deciding how the company goes in terms of, you're giving back the shares to me. And I remember telling my co-founder, I'm done, I've had enough of this. I've seen this far too many times. And I was scarred, and I'll be honest with everybody. But he brought some sense back into me. He says, let's listen to them, and always be prepared to walk away. And we did. We walked away, and we said, the reason why we're walking away is not because we're douchebags, it's simply because we don't believe the terms that are being put forth are fair. They are not fair terms. If you fear is, us running away with your cash, then let's not work together because this is not in good faith. Our history, our background shows otherwise. So we walked away from them six months. Um, uh, after six months after walking away from them, they came back. They said, hey guys, let's, let's reach common ground. What was the issue you had? And we expressed and we ironed out the kinks and we're now in partnership together. So how to manage investors is do not be too eager to sign a deal that looks too lucrative for you now. Because if it's lucrative now, put in the same amount of effort. Don't try and screw over anybody. That never works, ever. Be true to who you are. Be true to the business. And fingers crossed, they will come back again. Or another bunch of investors will come back again, which is what happened. We said, no, thank you. By the time they were coming back, we were being courted by four other international investors all quoting various amounts. So one thing I can give as advice to you entrepreneurs here, don't be quick to sell your shares and just because an offer looks good, spend time to understand it and make sure your investors gain value from you as much as you gaining value from them. And the number one question you should always ask is beyond capital, what value do you bring to the table? Because capital will end very soon or you know, you'll be given a very short string. But the next question you need to ask is okay, do you have best practice advice within my sector that you can give me? Do you have access to networks that I need access to? So instead of me spending your, your hard-earned marketing dollar, do you have anybody I can speak to that can get me access to the next stage of where the business should be? So I guess managing your investors is a delicate job, to be really honest. And it can go both ways. I've had uh, my friends within the e-commerce space who have had very negative experiences with foreign investors and also very negative experience with local investors. So my advice to you is make sure both of you understand and share a common goal first before money is brought to the table. And if that's the case, then say, okay, how much do you actually need? And a lot of entrepreneurs fall into the mistake of saying, I need, I need like $800,000. Why? I just need it. Don't ask me questions. I need 800 grand because I see the business going this way. So you end up falling into a position where you have more capital than you actually needed, which then puts a lot of pressure on you as a company and as a business to pay it back or to give back dividend of some sort. So you end up putting so much pressure on the team as well. So be true to yourself with how much you actually need 
to run your business. And if you have no idea, seek assistance. Seek mutual assistance regarding your true operating cost of that particular business. Hi, um, I hey. had a question about, uh, well, I was curious to know more about how you determine whether a person is big enough of a lunatic that yeah. you want, you're like, yes, I want to work with you and I want to add you to my family. Yeah, um, good, good question. Um, I guess I'll give you a working example of how it works at Rupu, uh, in, um, sorry, Umati Capital. So we have about um, seven people now and myself, my co-founder and the first two individuals individuals worked pro bono for literally eight months. We didn't pay them jack for eight long months, but yet they gave so much dedication. It's as though they had equity in the business. And we promised them equity in the business. We actually wrote everything down. But it's the work ethic. It comes down to work ethic. If somebody signs off at 5 p.m. and says, hey, I'm off, um, see you tomorrow at nine, it's not really the right person for you, and, and especially in the startup. A startup, is more like a consultancy job. And my experience in Accenture really taught me a lot where you end the job until the job is done. My gut feeling is what has helped me pick the right people. People whom you have to kick away and tell them, go home, it's now far too late. These are people who have, again, the immigrant work ethic. They believe in your goal, you, they believe in your dream. And it's a dream that actually it's honest and makes sense. And that's what we use as a common denominator across the people we hired. And we had another individual who joined in. And before he started, um, it's really, I like Americans, by the way, before I give this feedback. He came in and said, hey, hey guys, uh, I like what you guys are doing. It's great, fantastic. But I just want to let you know, um, I didn't come to Africa to be managed by Americans in an African company. But we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa slow down. The American you're talking about in our company has got a ridiculous work ethic and we respect him a hell of a lot more than we respect you right now. Because it was an early engagement, we said, hey, let's give this guy a second go. Um, he has a point. He wanted to come and get experience about working in Africa. But with that said, we weren't surprised when we had to fire him because he found every simple excuse as to why things could not be done. And things just took a little bit longer than they should have. And I'm not saying it's got nothing to do with foreigners or local individuals. It's just the individual themselves. If in an environment of a startup, you're working with so many unstructured problems coming out your way, and you need somebody who's result oriented rather than one who keeps asking, so what do I do next? What do I do next? Great, that's necessary for a mature structured organization. But in a startup environment, you need somebody who can handle the, the unstructured problem and get to a form of result rather than saying, I can't do this or can you help me with this? Give it a go. Nothing, there's no right or wrong way of doing something within a startup. But what counts most is the effort. So I guess what we have learned is before we bring on anybody on a full-time basis, we give them a three-month trial where we cover their, um, their basic expenses to ensure that before we bring you into the company and before you disrupt the culture we have in the company, you're actually a good fit. And everybody within the organization will also um, be part of recruiting or part of the recruitment process to ensure that they can spend time with you. If you're stuck at an airport with this person, can you spend three or four hours talking about everything but work? If you're stuck with this person in a restaurant because everybody has left, can you spend time with that person for an hour and talk about something meaningful? Again, it's, it's very delicate to hire the right person in a startup, but what's worked for me is their work ethic. Are they willing to say, you know what? What do you need done? Um, what tools do I have to my disposal? I'm gonna start getting cracking and get down to the job. And that's how I pick people. I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay, so I had a question. One second. Yeah, so 
Tell me if I've answered your question. Um, I'm just thinking it's not very sustainable. Sorry? Uh, it's not very sustainable. When you give people a three-month trial, I mean, I like especially given um, if you're at a, like what size the company you're at, like if, you're, if your interview is three months, not a lot of very smart people who are very capable are going to want to come work for you because that's not very good terms. Uh, contrary to that, I, I, hear, I hear your point. Yes, you can't have a three-month try period for the rest of the company's duration. It's just for the initial stage as the company is starting up. Why? You pick in one common denominator, work ethic. You cannot substitute work ethic. Yes, in about six or so months, we will change that to perhaps one month, but we'll pay full pay. And that's your typical your probation period. The reason why it's three months is because we've had an experience where we had somebody for far too long that we should have fired much earlier. And true, entrepreneurs, you're, you're told, hire slow, fire quick. But with that said, everybody's so busy doing their bit of the business that you don't have time to manage somebody. And that's what we've reacted to in terms of having a three-month window before we hire somebody. And to answer your question regarding you don't think that we may hire the smartest of people, everybody in my company has a remarkable story to tell. Co-founder, other than myself, um, city eight years across five different countries. Our associate worked as a head fund associate in New York, young man, age of 24. He's 24, but he bankrolled the company because as we're lending out, he was lending money to the business at 24 with two houses self-made. One of the other individuals is a former IBM consultant. He left as a manager from America. And the list goes on. It's not, there, is, there isn't a right formula to answer your question to hire the right person. But one thing that's worked again for me is understanding your work ethic. And I can't understand your work ethic in one month. It takes a lot longer and it takes three months. And if you're willing to have that discomfort to work with us for three months, and we just meet your cost, then at the end of three months, you, I guess you're the right person for us if you're willing to take shit for three months. But if you come in and say, I want to get paid today, I want to make my money today, then you and I and you and us will fall off, will fall off, will fall off very quickly. But three months is a test. The remarkable story is the showing of work ethic, right? right. So, so what makes you have a remarkable story? Um, a remarkable story, your background, your experience, what made you come to us, what, how we found you, what's the history of you. What, so when you decided to come and work for Marty or you heard about us, how did you hear about us? Why have you stopped doing whatever you're doing to come to us? That tells you a lot, a lot about the person. Are they jumping jobs? Are they looking for the next opportunity? Are they looking to build their career? Again, I'm not, this shouldn't go down as an argument. I'm just saying what well, I'm works for us. I'm just wondering what do you look for? What do you look for? I look for, as I said, the, the work ethic of somebody who is willing to put in the hours until the job is done. Not to check off and not to clock off at 5 p.m. Not that it's a bad thing to clock, clock off at 5 p.m. If you've got your job done, hey, I'll see you tomorrow. But if stuff still needs to be done, and you're checking out early and you're leaving people out by for them to sort out the problem and you're busy heading home and say, hey, do that, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. And the team is still trying to get stuff done. Then you're probably not the best fit for the organization. And it varies according to industry of the startup. Some startups, you can check off at five. It makes sense. But if you're building the organization, you've got a project in the middle of nowhere um, with zero support from the client. You have to get stuff done. Thank you. Okay, I had a question on uh, guerrilla marketing. Um, for a startup, and you talked about not selling, uh, avoiding to sell a lot of uh, equity. Yeah. So what other options are there for a startup? Instead of selling equity? I mean, like, like what you did, yeah. Okay, um, just to make sure I understand your question, are you asking, um, because you mentioned guerrilla marketing and you also mentioned equity and not giving out equity early. Because my understanding of uh, guerrilla marketing is to try as much as possible not to spend money. Yeah. So for a startup, um, 
most startups uh, have issues with uh, financing. Yes. So, and one of the ways to finance is to sell equity. Correct. Ah, yes. So, so what other options are there apart from selling the ma like equity you sold? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Convertible debt. Yeah. Um, I'm giving you answer. The answer is convertible debt. So, what we did with um, Omati, with one of our investors, is say, hey, um, we're going to take from you uh, X couple hundred thousand dollars and only a small portion of it will go into what you call equity at today's valuation. The majority of it will take it from you as debt. It will convert into equity at, upon us raising our Series A uh, funding, which means that as an entrepreneur, yes, you've got the pressure of paying back that money or else it converts into equity, but you still get access to the money for whatever reason why you, for whatever reason you're taking it. So you need to be very clear with yourself as to why you're going that route. Because there are also entrepreneurs in Nairobi that have lost their company because they took on debt and it kept converting into equity each time they couldn't pay it back. So eventually they lost the entire company. So be very careful with the different ways you get, um, you get money. I know it's a chicken and egg situation when it comes to um, working capital and running your business. It's so where do I get it from and how much do you have to lose to get it? Um, it's a trick question. What works for me again is um, being stubborn and, and just make sure you keep executing on your business. Make sure you're showing traction because a lot of investors want to see traction in your business before they can invest. So you need to quickly figure out what constitutes to traction in an investor's mindset? So, what's the cheapest, most affordable way to achieve that traction to check off what the investor needs? To get to a point you can actually negotiate on fair terms. Because if your business is pre-revenue, you can't really negotiate as much. You have no leverage. But if you're revenue generating, you've hit an X number of users that you're supposed to have had if your business is user-based or you have a certain number of customer base, then that's a different leverage you can have. So be careful in where you get the debt from as well. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you explain more about the role of Yeah, sure. Um, one of the challenges we were given from headquarters in Zurich was um, we're not going to give you guys anything beyond um, $3,000 for marketing. Um, today, I laugh because our budget for marketing in Ringier is well in the region of about 20 or so, $20,000 a month. Back then, what we did for guerrilla marketing was, I gave you an example of the iPhone 4. Um, the first day we launched uh, Rupu to the public, we partnered with Blankets and Wine. So what we did there is identify who is our target audience. We found our target audience. Now, which other business shares the same target audience as us, but is not in the same space as us? So we found Blankets and Wine. Great. How do you get access to Blankets and Wine and get your presence within Blankets and Wine to tell that audience that you share, hey, I exist? So what we did is we bought 50 tickets of Blankets and Wine, which were going for the time 2,000 shillings when they were much cheaper. How much are they now? Oh, it's, it's, not, that, it's not that long ago. Oh, okay. So what we did is we bought these tickets and what we wanted to achieve was metrics on our social media. So we wanted likes on our Facebook page. We also wanted to see signups on our Facebook page. We wanted to see deal purchases, which is revenue. And this is things that we're given by headquarters. So we told the public is, hey, um, come to Rupu, buy a deal. We don't care how much for. Um, and tell us why you want to win a blankets and wine ticket. Every winner would literally send a rider out with one of our guys or a car with one of our guys, take a picture of the person winning the ticket and being awarded the ticket so that others can see this is not a gimmick. So what we then did was on the day of the Blankets and Wine uh, event, we were there being introduced by, Mudo by Mudoni Donga as, hey guys, there's a company called Rupu, they do deals. In fact, 50 of you are here because of Rupu. And when she asked, hey, put up your hands who are here from Rupu, nobody did jack. Nobody put up their hands. 
Because you, you didn't want to look cheap, like you were here on free. Because you were there with your basket, with your wines. So we didn't, that didn't matter to us because we understood why the people were quiet. So another initiative we did um, was uh, we gave away a TV. In fact, that was a TV I had in my house until I was robbed. So it was a 40-inch TV that we bought from Nakumat at 70,000 shillings at the time, Sony. And we said to the people, hey, we're going to create a leaderboard. So we're going to give this TV away for the highest buyer of deals in the month of February 2011. So how that works is very simple. Keep buying deals on Drupal. We, we tell you where you are within the leaderboard. And we're honest with that. And you win a TV at the end of the month. But guess what that did for us? The first two people alone paid for the TV and some. So by the time the winner came to buy, to take the TV, he had spent about 50,000 shillings with us. It was a fair race. Number two had spent about 48 grand. So this guy who came in was actually a student, very entrepreneurial. He said, hey, I'm trying to get a new TV. And instead of spending 70 grand, I, I checked how much it is. I spent 50 grand for it. So he came over and he said, okay, okay, guys, I have a, I have a proposition for you. I said, all right, what's up? He said, um, I can sell this TV for 60 grand. Anybody willing to take it for cash? I was like, me, please. <laughs> so I switched 60 grand for a 70 grand TV. Everybody walked away happy. And that was one of the other guerrilla marketing tactics because what we did there is we created a leaderboard where we spurred transactions in exchange for a gift that was obvious. We then also did a, uh, a trip to Mombasa. Towards December, we did a guerrilla marketing campaign to in incentivize people to sign up for Rupal. So you, as if you sign up and we can track your sign up and you can invite several other people, the person with the most invites won a trip to Mombasa. And we gave away the trip to Mombasa for free. It wasn't, there wasn't a catch. So think about how or what metrics you want to collect for your marketing and reverse engineer that to an innovative, cost-effective way for you to achieve your goal. May I, ask, may I ask a question? Just before, just still on the guerrilla marketing. So Rupu previously uh, is kind of different from the way it is now. Uh, previously, there used to be, the, it was the pure group one model. Yeah. Whereby people had to buy a certain deal until they taped over. Yes. And then the deal was activated. Yes, yes. I remember personally buying a deal on Rupu and shouting at my friends, telling them to buy that same thing. Yeah. So that now, of course, things would move on. Yeah. Um, why did that stop? It stopped because um, there was pressure from headquarters to sell more deals. And we had to tailor the Groupon model to Africa, to Kenya. Number one, um, in typical Groupon style or group buying style in the West, you'd leave your, your credit card with the site. And each time you come on board, you just buy. It debits from your credit card. Kenyans don't like that. They're like, ah, I'm not too sure you're gonna do my money. So we had to have a payment gateway that deducted funds based on the now. So that's why um, free advertising for Pesapal, we worked with Pesapal. The reason why we changed the model from um, uh, a deal being live until it tips over is because we had to sell more deals. And when we first, first started, we were doing a deal a day. That was so much pressure for us because everybody became a salesperson. And your job before the company shut was make sure you get us a deal from a friend, family. We don't care if you had to beg, borrow, steal. But we needed a deal for the following morning. Over time, we had to drop that model because we found that there were certain deals that were fairly high-end, um, would cost about 5 or 6K, sometimes 15K. And if you have a tipping point of maybe 10 people for a deal worth that much, not many people were willing to put forth their money First, that amount of money. Let's just start from there. So we figured, how do we just get volumes? We're like, take away that tipping um, um, idea and just sell deals. Just keep selling. So we reached out to our sales team, Alan and his team, and we just said to them, hey, guys, just bring us as many deals as possible. And also competition. Um, Mortality Deals um, stepped in, and Zetu was stepping up their, their game. And 
we couldn't because if it doesn't tip what would have to happen is you refund everybody who bought the deal and if you're going to refund the deal it means the amount of money you spent on facebook and google advertising that deal has literally gone down the drain plus the cost of sending back the cash to whoever bought so we're like we're barely making ends meet we have to change that model so that's why i changed and i'm i'm surprised you followed it thank you uh okay we need to Yeah, interesting question. Um, one of my mentors the other day shocked me by saying, he introduced me to one of his friends. He says, hey, 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 I want you to meet a young man. He's called Minutu. I'm now his mentee. I was like, whoa, when did that change? I realized things changed when I looked at stuff very differently. It's important to have guidance. It's, it's great, but it's not necessarily necessary. Um, first, be true to who you are. Don't try and BS your way through. And I found that I had to put pressure on myself. Um, a brief history about myself. Um, I lost my father when I was 11, and my mom brought bought myself up and my sister up over all these years. So I didn't really have a male role model. So all I knew was my mother. And also now, being in Kenya and being away from her, I had to stand on my own two feet. So you almost have to draw your own blueprint as you grow along and trust that you're in the right direction. And don't be too proud and too eager and too um, arrogant to say, I could be wrong stay flexible and say hey I, I don't like the way I treated that person I don't like the decision I made not too long ago perhaps I need to tone down my aggression and be a little bit more patient with the people I'm around um, but to answer your question mentors haven't really worked out for me in, in Kenya I found that the way they're too busy um, or I'll talk to them and they look at me a bit funny they're like are you sure you're okay <laughs> and I go home and I talk to my other half. I'm like, what do you think of this? She's like, yeah, it makes sense. I talk to my business partner. I was like, what do you think of this? Yeah, yeah it makes sense. And you start to have confidence in your own judgment. Because uh, I feel like the other drawback of having mentors is you won't make a decision unless you run it by them. And that has a detrimental effect sometimes. I'm not saying you run off thinking that you know it all, but build more confidence in yourself in making the right decisions. And I can't tell you how that would, what it means, but for me, it was making a call and looking back and be like, okay, nothing's gone wrong. We're good, we're good, we're good. So I put that in my mental database, like let's repeat that again in the future. But I also made mistakes and I needed guidance to have made a better decision. And that's why I was willing to eat humble pie and be like, hey, um, care to advise me? I don't think I made the right decision. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I was young. I was 20, I was 28, 27, 28 when I came to Kenya. And I was still driven by, you know, being a young man, you need to, you know, make sure you look good. You drive a decent car, you go to decent places, you impress the right uh, ladies. Uh, sorry, babe. So the challenge at the time was the internal challenge. You're running out of cash and you can, you, you can do your mental math and be like, shit, I can't afford to be in this place. But you have to push yourself a little bit longer and say, hey, 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 you're only going to spend like 300 shillings more. Stop looking like a broke bastard. You have to enjoy life. But at the same time, you know your pennies are depleting real quick. So you're torn. You now start, I remember... I'll be honest with you guys. Um, there was one time I was so broke in Mombasa. I'd visit family friends, turn up at 7.30, be like, hey, how you been? I know it's dinner time. 
because I was living alone in um, in Mombasa, and some of the challenges were I didn't have time to cook. I didn't have time to be me. Um, and just like you, I lost myself for at least a year and a half. That I was constantly. It's like you're 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 fighting a fire that never dies. The other challenge I had internally was um, socializing. Um, my friends or the acquaintances I had were the group of individuals who liked to party the following morning on a Sunday, be like, yo, man, I like midnight, I blacked out after that second bottle of black label or whatever. And I was like, this is not my crowd. And I struggled to fit in somewhere. And until I realized I don't have to fit in, I'm not bothered to fit in anymore. Just be you. Be you and be happy being you. And I found myself going to movies alone, uh, going to restaurants alone, just chilling. I looked like a customer waiting for someone, but I didn't care. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges I had, just having people I can talk to who relate to me. Um, that was painful for me because you sit down with your uncles and aunties, family friends, you know, they ask, so Kijana, how's business going? They want to hear, oh, all is well, I've got a Prado Land Cruiser outside, you can see, and it's, it's working, yeah? my business is working. When you tell them, yes, I have X number of customers, the next question is, oh, okay. You can see in their faces, like, so why do you look the way you look? You know, shouldn't you have upgraded yourself slightly? And my advice to entrepreneurs is don't struggle to fit in. Don't struggle to try and be like what the rest of the world is. Be yourself. Create your own environment. And that's what I did. I created my environment. Luckily, I had um, one or two friends who are actually friends. And I wish I could establish the line between an acquaintance and a friend back then. Um, everybody who I thought were friends turned out to be acquaintances. Um, but they're those that supported me. They're those who, on a random day, were like, hey, Jude, here's 10K. I'm like, what? They're like, just here's 10 grand. Don't pay me back. Just here's 10 grand. I can see you need it. And I never forgot them. But until I actually was comfortable being in my own skin, as a entrepreneur, you end up living a very, very lonely life. Very lonely. Very few people get you. Because you're having a discussion over drinks with someone, and they don't just understand you. They're in a different mindset. For them, taking risks is just, ah, I don't want to take risks. True. True. Yeah. True. Yeah. Yes, they keep switching hierarchy from time to time. and um, But you have to step off the, the stage and tell yourself, what am I doing? From time to time, you have to ask yourself, what am I doing? Otherwise, you'll burn out and end up in a hospital doing surgery, you know, being operated on or with a rash. Because, yes, it's a thin line between, or a gray line between work-life balance. But you have to do something that shows you out a little bit. Hello. Good. Hello. Hey. Good evening. I'm Paul. Hey, Paul. And... Uh, Good evening, guys. It's been fun hearing you talk about entrepreneurship, in, especially Thanks. in this country, because for most of us, I believe that you are reading from our script. Whatever you have saying that you have gone through, we are going through. But mine is a little bit comment about the friendship thing. I have seen that in my life, I'd rather have allies than friends. Correct. Because an ally we can help each other out. I can help you with this. You can help Thanks me with that. Yeah. So I try to uh, eliminate. Not, not, I'm not saying it in a bad light. No, no, no. I completely understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Business is is furious. Yes. It's a beast. Yeah. And there is no space for emotions. True. So I agree with that. But there is one weakness I've noted in Kenya. Yeah. And that is not something you can ignore. Yeah. Kenyans have great minds. 
but unfortunately they don't have capital. Yes. And the bank can run you out if you do take a loan. Correct. Because you get about 12% to 20% interest on, on loans. Yeah. It doesn't even get better when you are taking a loan for a business because you have a short time Correct. To, pay back. to pay back that money. Correct. So I heard you say in the beginning that you are having this company that is leading right now to agricultural companies Correct. or farmers. Yeah. And I would tend to think that the reason why you are not leading to entrepreneurs is because there is a risk. Because most um, guys have, uh, just want to yeah, keep yeah. that in your mind for yeah. a while. You answer me that question later. Yeah. The reason why businesses have not been loaned enough money to start up is because there's a lot of risk when you're lending money to to the locals, maybe because of their business, uh, uh, how they put it out to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, my last comment is. Uh, the grind, the, the, yep. the startup, the, diffi the difficulties. Yeah. Very good. Very that you don't have to balance this and that. Yeah. At the, be the beginning, it's very, it's very hard. hard. Correct. Correct. I believe, I believe that, that the grind must, must, must be there. The gold, the gold must, must be banned. Be banned for it to be pure. pure. Correct. Correct. And, and just, just to give an example for myself. Yeah. I, I, this big idea. Big idea. And, and the reason, the reason I had that, I had that idea is uh, yes, uh, because of my position in Malaysia in Malaysia at that moment. Correct, correct. And also, and also, I believe my country. See whether, see whether that uh, yeah, can, yeah, can go through. Correct, correct. But unfortunately, but they are glad they landed in. They didn't know English, English for start for start Okay, okay. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the I sold my I sold my idea. It was a good idea, but because I was also supposed to get some yeah, country, they they made a money, but me up, me up, because they had they had the. Must say, must say, work, yeah, work, yeah, 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 so, so, uh, uh, I think my, my other question, other question is that, is that, uh, I'm, 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 I'm lost, lost. <laughs> okay, okay, but, but, maybe you can, you can, can help, you can help, I can help with the first question, question regarding, regarding, um, what um, accounting um, gambling to on two months of yours, um, um, contrary, contrary, believe, believe, the reason why we started, we started, Marty, with Eric, Eric, um, was that, was that, we found, we found a lot of entrepreneurs who were struggling to capital. capital. Yet, yet, the local market didn't market understand didn't the entrepreneurship space. space. If you go to a bank, to a bank typically, typically um, I don't know if it's, changed, it's changed, changed, but if you went to a bank with an idea, idea the first the judge you based on the typical banking, banking denomination. So do you have collateral? Do you have security? Okay. Great. Right. What kind of security and collateral is it? Okay. Then okay. pledge it to the bank. But we can only give you a portion of that collateral. And that still goes on today. And for that very reason, that is why Wati Capital came to be. So our first initial business model was to create um, an online uh, crowdsourcing or crowdfunding platform for entrepreneurs to connect with investors. And what we wanted to do and achieve with Eric was to standardize the term sheets for entrepreneurs to ensure they don't get ripped off, but also standardize the term sheets to ensure the, the investors enjoyed a good uh, pool of investees, or entrepreneurs. So that was the initial idea. But when we reached out to your so-called investors, very few investors were willing to take that risk, especially local. You tell them, hey, uh, I need you to, to pledge at least two to five million shillings for three to five years. Yes, have faith, the business will succeed. Yes, it's a young business, they don't have experience in business before, but we need your money. A lot of them laughed at us. They're like, are you kidding? So what we end up doing is we flipped it. Instead of saying, if you, instead of doing equity, what we focus on is debt. So these businesses give us debt as Omati Capital, and we then lend it on to whoever SME we're dealing with. So to tell you how we mitigated the situation, what we did is say, all right, let us pick um, good buyers. So for instance, you're supplying milk to Brookside. To give you an argument how we work. You're supplying milk to Brookside and you're a cooperative. You've got 30, 40, maybe some of the cooperative has 16,000 farmers. So we're gonna lend to you as a cooperative because you have a circle going on with your farmers downstream. We're not gonna ask any collateral from you, but on the basis that we know the financial strength of Brookside, who is the eventual payer, we will lend you that money. 
So the due diligence is not run on you, but on your eventual pay year. So you can see where this is going. Eventually, we're currently relying on external investors to give us that cash to then online. But eventually, we're going to reach out to you guys and say to you guys, hey, you got a random 5K, 6, 7K, maybe 10K at the end of a month. Can you lend to an organization that's supplying milk to Brookside? For now, it's dairy. But we're venturing into other sectors. So our business model works in, in ev whenever environment where there's somebody waiting to be paid by a larger organization. So instead of waiting, we give you an advance on that payment because we know the person who's paying is good for their money. And we don't ask for collateral. So yes, it's a bit tricky to lend to entrepreneurs in this country. And that's, what, that's why they call us entrepreneurs. You have to think outside the box and where you're gonna get your cash. And a bank is not the first place I would go. And I've, I've never gone to a bank for money and they said yes, they always turn me down. And I'm grateful they turned me down because the pressures of paying back can be fairly steep. So what we did instead is, now this is where your friends and family come in handy. When you're starting a business, I managed to convince a bunch of friends and family that, hey, I kind of know what I'm doing. I need some cash from you. Then they said, okay, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take risk on you. And you say, cool, I'll sell you three or 4% of the company. That's a lot, but What's the other choice? I'd rather deal with a friend for repayment than deal with a bank for repayment. So a couple of those guys, and make sure your business model is solid, that you can actually show traction and kind of pay it back. But at the same time, it's important to raise funding from investors. You pay off your angel investors first downstream or make them comfortable that you're at a stage you now can be invested in by foreigners. And I'm sorry you lost your business when you went to foreign land um, it's very unfortunate. I don't know. Really sorry to hear that. So I, don't, I hope I've answered your question regarding the raising money from banks in Kenya. Yes, you have. Uh, maybe Mr. Munyuki, you can just comment uh, in finishing that uh, in US or in UK yeah. or in China or in the Far East, yeah. the grind is really hard because most of the immigrants even who are there yeah. have to work more than t two part-time jobs just to make ends meet. Very true. There is nothing actually to balance when you are out there. Yes. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be really honest, guys. Um, growing up in, in East London, um, I grew up there for 15 years. I spent more time in England than I did in Kenya. And I kind of, I'm a bit lost sometimes as to where home is. Yes, I was born here, but I I know less here than I do of England. But what I can say to a lot of you, and a lot of us sometimes have the impression that if you go to these countries, that life is better there. Um, take a look first at our country. There's a reason why we're having a lot of visitors coming in. It's a sign that tells you the opportunity is in Africa. It's in Kenya. The life we lead in England, not just uh, immigrants as myself, but even my own friends born and bred in England is, it's a tough one. You're, the reason why, one of the biggest reasons I left England was because I looked at my stepdad and he's, at the time he was 55 and his biggest investment was the house we're living in. And I was like, shit, if this goes down, he's really in a tough spot. I can't live like that. Because now the conversations I exchange or would find ourselves exchanging during drinks is because you're a new homeowner you talk about you know how you how you got your new mortgage the house is worth a quarter of a million pounds and that's quite a lot and you're like yeah I'm paying it back but when shit hit the fan in 2008 during the financial crisis people were committing suicide because the house you've been paying for for the last 15 years you're now paying double and you can barely have anything to live on and that's, that was your biggest investment. So that alone made me, it tipped me to say, I'm going, I'm going home. I don't know why, but I know this place is not it. And I like to advise a lot of people that before you take flight outside the country, please exhaust what you have in here. We, it is much easier to set up a company in this country and in this continent than it is to set up one in the West. This, the markets in the West are so mature 
and there's a lot of more there's a lot more bureaucracy in setting up corporations in the West than it is in Kenya. And I repeat again, there's a reason we're seeing a lot of visitors from all over the world flock into our country. We have amazing opportunity. So before you complain that things are not working out for you, make sure you've exhausted every angle, every turn up every stone, and make sure you try and achieve something here. And personally, I had a dream. And my dream 10 years ago was a dream car like most guys. The dream car I managed to buy here, my friends in England who are still in Accenture with very high in job, very high in salaries cannot afford it. I'm not saying I'm special, but what I'm saying is the opportunity that Kenya presented is far greater than that in England. Because one, you buy the car in England and pay duty in equivalence to the same value of the vehicle again to get it through the ports. Now that was but a dream for me, a dream which I never thought I'd achieve in my lifetime. But being in Kenya, I was like, shit, it's actually possible. And it gave me a lot more courage to say, all right, what's my next dream? I want to hit it. I couldn't do that in England. Okay, guys, I think we need we need like a, a breather. We need to wrap up. <laughs> Munyoshi is here, so you'll, you'll talk to him after. Should we let her ask the last question? Yeah, uh, let her ask the question because she was dying to ask a question. Thanks, Betty. Um, hi, my name is Carol. And hey, Carol. Um, I wanted to ask, what are your thoughts about women in IT? About women in entrepreneurship? Yes, IT and... Oh, women in IT. Yeah. Okay. Have you come across those ones who are ahead of you or those ones who are almost at where you are? And what what are the factors uh, out of your experience have you noticed in women? Wow. Okay, to start off with, um, I never looked at it that way. I, I, an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur, male or female. Um, I never, ever assessed anybody based on their sex. 
Um, but I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, Kenya is a space where that is a delicate matter. Um, I can definitely say I've seen quite a lot within um, that space. The Akira chicks, for starters. A bunch of people I really respect. Um, with the founders and, and, and the mindset they had to create Akira chicks, an environment where um, they take slum, slum girls, educate them on how to program, get jobs for them, and send them out to the employment world. Um, wow, I'm, I'm stuck for words. I've, I've never looked at, to say, okay, you're a chick, you're in tech, or you're an entrepreneur, how, how, how will I treat you? Again, I, I blame where I was brought up. We, we don't look at sexes or race. Yes, people look at me as, you, know, you, you, you couldn't even pronounce my name. Um, and my name was M for many years. But I never looked at judging people based on their sex or ha what have you achieved as a woman within entrepreneurship? What have you achieved as a woman within the tech space? Um, but with that said, now that you're actually making me think about it, I've come across a lot of um, successful techpreneurs in my time, both men and women. One of them is here um, running a, um, a, an online laundry service where her previous job was a banker. She broke the business even within six months. I've got friends of mine, guys, who've been at it for three years, have not seen a single penny. One of my so-called mentors, um, actually one of my mentors, Ken Jiroge of Celeland, um, he will tell you he ran the company for six years before he saw his first dollar. Now, man, man or woman, I respect the hustle. I respect the dedication. But I definitely don't look at it as, oh, so you're a chick. How are you doing again? How's it been? But I also understand where you're coming from. My country, unfortunately, doesn't is very sexist in a lot of things. That I will not pretend. It doesn't exist. But, and I can't begin to advise you on what to do. Other than just stay true to your cause, you'll find idiots along the way. Um, but with that said, just, I don't know, I can't advise you. I'm so sorry about, about that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, is, it is work experience. Just don't let it affect you, is what I can just say. Um, to give you an example, uh, my other half, we've been to pitches. Um, pitching for business and um, I was sat in the meeting and th this guy barely looked at her for a second uh, she was talking to him but he's looking at me while I'm responding to her and I had to deal with that and reiterate to him that I'm an employee in this particular venture so he needs to deal with my boss and until my fiance had eventually told me hey just work with a system and I was, it really it it really took a bite in my fair world but how do you start changing that um, I guess that's one of the drawbacks I can say about my own country equality of the sexes and by the way um, I'm a big Beyonce fan <laughs> and you know where I'm going with this Flawless. All right. Anyway. Okay. Great. So thank you so much, Minuto. Um, maybe just to wrap up, out of everything you've mentioned, yeah. and probably more that's still somewhere, yeah. what did you say is the biggest mistake of all that you made? Wow. Not having come here sooner. I took too much time being outside the country. And I completely agree with them. Um, it's let's face it I'm always going to be a visitor wherever I go that's not my home country or my home continent um, and I, I struggled for many years trying to fit in into that environment try to be a professional uh, made sure I worked hard and I got to work for the best company in the world when it comes to management consulting but it was not enough um, I had a decent life I mean 
for those who know, Accenture training is pretty lavish. They treat you like a king for two months. Um, they take you to, to Chicago for training. You're driven in a limo from training center to training center. And as far as you're concerned, you're like, yeah, man, I could get used to this. Then I go back to London, and they staffed me into um, a, a telecom called British Telecom, where all I was doing is crunching Excel numbers, getting a good salary, very good salary, but all I was doing is Excel. And I was like, this is not enough for me. Um, I needed more. So I complained to my manager, who indeed complained to my senior executive, but I saw the same thing. I knew you were going to work your way up the ladder. So I look back. My manager was, was on his third marriage. My senior executive divorced like twice. And I was like, is this the life for me? And I knew despite the good salary, the quality of life is what matters most. It wasn't there. I uh, didn't have a good quality of life. I spent two hours a day in a train like this. To work, back home. I get to work, not exactly the right skin tone, so I have to put in the extra effort. You leave work at about 7.30, 8, just to make sure you're recognized. You go home, repeat the same grind for two and a half years. You want to shoot yourself. So one day I said, you know what, enough. I don't care what I'm coming to here, but I'm just coming home. I know I have a brain, I put two and two together, I'll survive. So I came home with the immigrant work ethic of saying, something's got to give. Something has to work out. And here I am today. Cool. I know some people here want to kill me for letting this run for so long. But um, there's, there's value in everyone's questions being had because we all learn from them. So thank you, Mimitri. Thank you for making time. And please stay because I know there's still a few more discussions that people want to yeah, have. With thank you. you for having me. I'm really humbled by the invite. Truly humbled. Okay. So before you leave, um, a lot of this discussion has been dominated by friendship. So I want to present to you a book by Dale Carnegie. <laughs> the reason I'll I'm laughing is because this young man told me about this yesterday. And by the way, this young man that you see here, um, anyone want to take a guess how old he is? 19? Any other bets? Shit, then I'm probably the worst one to judge age. Yes, you're right, he's 22. Uh, and it gets better. He's graduating on Monday, right? Yes. He's graduating from actuarial science from Jake Watt. And there were about 200 applicants? Uh, about 150. 150. And how many are graduating? Okay. In my campus? Five. Yeah. You hear that? Five. It gets, it gets better. It gets better. For the last two years, he's been running a company while in university. And I commend him. Staying true to the grind and also staying true to your education that you can fall back on. And I thought I knew shit. And I was like, damn, this kid is like 10 years younger than me. So we're talking and he says to me, yeah, some of the projects I'm doing, I'm running a drone for agriculture uh, fixed with a GoPro camera. I'm like, where the hell did you come from? <laughs> and guys, look, don't always look to the mainstream for advice you know, on, on how to do shit. Take time to look around you and ask questions. I walked away feeling so humbled yesterday after I met this young man. Um, and what does your company do? Uh, we're a data science company specializing in web media. All right, yes. just name me two of your clients. Philips and Safaricom. He's 22. At 22, I was busy trying to hook up with <laughs> skirts, young ladies. <laughs> And I, I'm, really I'm really humbled by seeing such dedication at a very uh, young age. And I sometimes feel like there, is, there isn't enough um, publicity on such individuals where there's a lot of focus on the mainstream guys who will always give you mainstream ways of doing things. There's also, there's also another way. There's a grind. There's a hustler's way. And I respect the hustler's way a lot. And that's one that I salute you, Odanga. And since this conversation was dominated a lot by friends, I'd like to give you this book because one thing I know is I read it. And this is a book that has very... How many of you have read this book in the audience? 
What did you think about it? Shout if you can. Anyone else? Anyone else who's the two ready? ladies Anyone? design company? What do you think of it? Personally, okay. I found this book to be very profound. The lessons are so simple. But like I told you, Warren Buffett only has one certificate on his wall. And it's uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People Training by Dale Carnegie. That's it. He said, I have degrees and all that, stuff, but that doesn't matter to me. This was had the most profound effect on my life. And I read it and I was equally as shocked. So to the friends you've lost, sure. <laughs> I hope this helps you gain new ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's it for Startup Grand Nairobi, 7th edition. Uh, a huge round of applause for Munyutu. So, um, yes, huge round of applause. Applause. And I'd like to thank our sponsors. I'd like to thank the iHub for letting us use their space. I'd like to thank Buy More. Uh, Buy More is a student discount card. And one of those startups that's going to exit sometime soon. Um, and I'd like to thank Business Mind Magazine. They didn't have their banner up, but the guy is Oscar here. They are our media partners. And I know I've kept you here for so long, but please don't go. We have food and two reasons why you should come for Startup Grind. One is the lessons. Two is the networking. For example, I'll just point out a few people in the room who I think would be interesting to talk to. Uh, Jerry Chalimo, Wave. She, she runs a developer school where she teaches all kinds of people from students to graduates about how to code. So if you're a startup, if you're a company, if you're looking for devs, she'd probably be the person to talk to. Uh, Stephen Gugu, Wave. He, he's got a background in law and finance, and he consults coach, coaches, mentors, startups. If you're an entrepreneur, he'd be a great person to talk to. Uh, Malaika, Wave. She is part of the Savannah Fund, a VC fund that um, accelerate startups all over Africa. She'd be great to talk to, and I think she has some investor friends in the room. Uh, there's someone else. You've just set her up for trouble right there. Yeah, I know. Oops. <laughs> but I'm glad she came. And Alan Matata, um, he's head of sales at Jumia. So if you want to do more consulting about e commerce uh, in your country, that'd be great. And more people who have stories who I just haven't met yet. So please stay, have some food, and enjoy. And the last person, um, I think she's really cool. Her name is Arushi, and she's here on an internship at Ushahidi. She's a student from Stanford. She has like a lot of stories to share. She has an amazing personality to share. And I'd like her to just come up and tell us about this one thing that she's doing that is her way of trying to connect with the Nairobi community while she's here for a few months. Two seconds. Okay, hi guys, I won't take much of your time. Um, there is this social experiment that's happening or is starting to happen in Nairobi right now. Um, it's called Tea with Strangers. And what it is, is you have a host and five strangers who meet for tea for two hours and talk about life. And it started in a year and a half ago in the Bay Area. And it's, it, I think in eight or nine cities right now in America. And Nairobi is the first city. Um, I had my first tea time yesterday. I'm the only host right now. And I'm here for only another month. So what I'm trying to do is get this started off. And I'm looking for people, hosts, who are, who are like value insight from other people. Um, it's kind of a two hours with no baggage. You have no idea who you're going to meet, what you're going to talk about. So it's just a lot of serendipity. So um, I just want to tell you about that. You can go check out the uh, website at tbitstrangers.com. And of course, you can come talk to me about it later. That's all. Thank you. Okay, great. So guys, mingle, eat, drink, talk, and forgive me for keeping you here forever. <laughs>